So you caught me mid-breakfast, making my little favorite breakfast sandwich here. It's a little sweet potato base, eggs, some kale, and some homemade hot sauce for my sister Lauren in Texas. It's good to sweat in the morning from the inside and the out. We're gonna break down Glenn Powell's diet. Right out the gate, he's starting with a pretty darn good breakfast there, right? We got a couple of eggs and he's making it, instead of on toast, he's making it on a thin slice of sweet potato, which is pretty darn awesome. I also like what he said, you gotta sweat from the inside out, right? So there is some evidence that capsaicin, like with some hot sauce or some cayenne in the morning, can have a moderate effect when it comes down to your thermogenesis. I mean, it's not ridiculous, it's a couple percent, but it does do some stuff. There is some evidence that capsaicin and hot things in the morning have an impact. There's also some weird evidence that having like spicy stuff hitting your tongue can actually create this alertness. In fact, having something spicy or bitter or sour can actually have like a stimulatory effect, which is kind of wild, That that's neither here nor there. Let's talk more about his actual diet and what it looks like. Before we heavily get into Glenn's diet, I put a link down below for Element Electrolytes. So Element Electrolytes are a calorie-free, sugar-free, 1,000 milligram sodium, 200 milligram potassium, 60 milligram magnesium electrolyte drink. They have stick packs, so you can just mix them with water, make it super easy, completely do curb your appetite, but also tremendous if you're sweating. Then they also have their new sparkling version, same exact formula, but in a sparkling can. So a can with sparkling water. So it can replace soda. Now, if you use that link down below, because they're a sponsor of my channel, you get a free sample variety pack of all the different stick flavors with any purchase. So you go on there, you make any purchase using that link down below and you get a free sample variety pack. Element has been on this channel for a super long time. If you are looking for a way to just kind of have something in the morning without consuming calories and get that energy up and feel a little bit more awake without caffeine, that is a great way to do it. Also, I just sip on it throughout the day to curb my appetite. So check them out in the top line of the description underneath this video. Now let's check out Glenn's diet. And here is the fridge. So I'm a big cooker. I like to cook. So salmon, chicken, those are kind of the go-to staples as a Texan game days. You gotta come prepared with all the meat. All right, boys got my respect already. Obviously a big meat guy, so am I, I get that. So when you take a look at the types of meat that he has, Okay, opting for the leaner cuts of meat already, but I know Texans. I lived in Texas for quite a while and I know that that brisket's gotta be in there somewhere, right? As a kid, was never good with milk. You'll never see cheese in my fridge. I always have my milk replacements. I got milk and I got some, I don't even know how to pronounce it, Califia, I don't even know, uh, whatever. Yeah, he's talking about the Califia farms. So he's got oat milk and he's got some like almond milk type stuff. Um, I used to be a huge, huge almond milk fan, and I think from a caloric standpoint, it makes sense. Just be careful when you're looking at almond milks or oat milks. A lot of times they have a bunch of added sugar in them, so they're really not always the best thing. Uh, people will look at milk and they'll say, okay, well that's like sugar water. I mean, yes, there is sugar in milk, but if you don't have a milk issue, there's always things like Fairlife milk, which no sponsor, no affiliation, anything like that. Fairlife milk is more of a filtered milk, so you're gonna have higher protein content, lower sugar content. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of oat milk, and here's why. Because I don't have an issue with eating oats because you're getting the fiber, you're getting all this stuff, but a lot of times when you make oat milk, you're basically just rinsing impurities out of oats and putting them into a beverage. That's what I don't like about it. Now, almond milk, I don't really have an issue with, and here's why. I mean, yes, you're getting some phytates, yes, you're getting oxalic acid or oxalates, and if you're not consuming it off the hook, that's probably not that big of a deal. And the thing is, at least with the almond milk, you're not really extracting the fats from the almonds, so you're not getting potentially oxidized oils. You're really just getting like chalky almond dust in water. So if you can handle the taste of it, it's kind of, I don't know, benign. It doesn't really have a whole lot of calories, so I'm not opposed to that. What else we got here? Kabucha but I don't like a sweet kombucha, I like a spicy kombucha, so. Here's kind of interesting stuff on kombucha. I'm not here to rain on Glenn Powell's parade. The guy looks great, he's doing awesome. And I think that kombucha can absolutely be a part of someone's healthy diet. I just want people to understand that there are no bodies of evidence as of right now that really support kombucha for gut health, okay? If you like it as a tasty beverage, if you like it in lieu of a soda, that's fine. Just know that a lot of them have a lot of sugar in them and it's still just a sweet treat at the end of the day. The microbiome benefit that you get from it is really hard to trace. Almost all the probiotic food evidence is coming from either fermented vegetables, which is still going to have things like prebiotic fiber that could be influencing the response, or some forms of fermented dairy. So kefir, yogurt, cottage cheese, things like that. 
That's where the evidence lies. It doesn't mean that there isn't evidence that can come out on kombucha, but it doesn't seem to have a huge impact on overall microbiome or gut health. I am known for going through a tub of hummus a night. It's not great for you probably, but I don't know, I like it. I just... Hummus is an interesting one. Uh, I mean, yeah, if you're gonna go through a whole tub of it a night, that could obviously be a lot of calories, but clearly, I mean, the proof is in the pudding. You're, you're not overweight, you look great, you're in shape, you're staying pretty darn shredded. The thing with hummus is there is a big, big difference between hummus and packaged hummus from the store, right? If you like hummus, the best thing you could possibly do for yourself is make it yourself because it is so easy to make, right? You can just use chickpeas, you can use olive oil, you can use some salt, a few spices. You can make hummus so easily. If you go to the store, and I shop at healthy stores, so I'll go to Sprouts, I'll go to Trader Joe's, I'll go to Whole Foods. Literally, sometimes the only time I can find a hummus that doesn't have soybean oil or sunflower oil or some other potentially nefarious oil is at like Erewhon, and I don't feel like spending $22 at Erewhon in Santa Monica or Calabasas to get hummus. But you can find some occasionally, right? Here's the deal. I don't have an issue with the sunflower oil. I don't have an issue with that. What I have an issue with is when it's sitting on a shelf and it becomes oxidized. Olive oil is a monounsaturated fat, which means it's stable, much more stable than a polyunsaturated fat. So if it's sitting at either close to room temp or out on your counter or on an open air refrigerated shelf, it's probably oxidized. And that's not just like naturalistic fallacy BS. Oxidized oils are way worse than sugar, way worse than anything, because they do have an effect when it comes down to oxidative stress in the body. It's called lipid peroxidation, it's very real. So long-winded way of saying, dude, hummus is great, Mediterranean style is awesome, but maybe you should make your own or have someone that works for you make it for you, something like that. I think growing up in Texas, you eat chicken fried steak, fried okra, gravy, you just don't do that every week. You try to chill out on the, the fried okra. I think it's fried okra is less fried okra in my diet. Fun fact, when I had uh, Dr. Jacob Torres on my channel, we were talking about frying. We were talking about what happens when you fry food, even when it's good food, okay? Advanced glycation in products are a super real thing. And when you heat foods really, really, really hot, even in an air fryer, you can cause advanced glycation in products to form. These advanced glycation in products will trigger oxidative stress. They are oxidative stress, really. So they are basically the caramelization in a way. It's like if you cook onions uh, and you caramelize an onion in a pan, when it caramelizes, it's caramelizing the sugar. That's essentially what is happening inside your cells. You're, not, you're kind of caramelizing sugar to a protein and you're caramelizing potentially fats to a protein. And that is creating something that is a rampant creator of oxidative stress in the body. And it sounds like I'm some woo-woo weirdo. Guys, this is real. In fact, you know what? Let's cut to a clip really quick talking about chicken nuggets from Dr. Jacob Torres because I wanna put this on a PhD that really knows what they're talking about and let him explain it. So this is a clip from one of my videos where he mentioned this chicken nugget study and advanced glycation end products. So the study was they, they gave participants uh, chicken McNuggets. That was the, that's the study. And they were gonna look at kidney function. And they found that immediately after feeding chicken McNuggets to people, they saw a decrease in kidney function that persisted for, I believe it was two weeks after, after the feeding. So it's kind of this like, yeah, not, it doesn't sound like a good a good thing to do to people. Is it, I mean, it's, and it's probably just because of the case that it's fried. I mean, just your. It's, it, I think that was the main thing they were researching was the effect of the fried component. Yeah. The oxidized oils. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the whole, the whole thing has going to be oxidized. Yeah. All of the proteins and whatnot, even inside are probably oxidized. How could that, how does that affect kidneys? Uh, so there's a, there's a group of compounds called advanced glycation end products or AGEs. And these are compounds that occur when, um, when carbohydrates get fixed to proteins. So like these proteins become kind of like they're changes their structure essentially by fixing these carbohydrates to it. And there are receptors in the kidney or all over our body there. It's called the, the rage receptor, mm -hmm. the receptor of <laughs> AGEs. So it's just, it's a great thing to say because they have this rage receptor and they, that causes inflammation on itself. So if, any, if it detects these compounds and it triggers inflammation, 
So one of the effects of that is actually uh, alters the fluid balance. So the sodium uptake gets changed. So, you know, people get really kind of puffy after they eat like fried foods. It's partially because this is the reason why it's not the salt. That's not like the excess salt. It's that the kidneys are actually the function of the kidneys changing to inc- to pull up more fluid because they're the function's gone down. Eggs is always great, but a lot of times I like to skip breakfast so that I make just a massive honking lunch. I like to do a workout in the morning, start my day, and then afterwards, protein shake, solid lunch, big dinner. Okay, back up for a second. So you're telling me, once again, another Hollywood type that intermittent fasts. I might be biased because I like fasting, because it works with my lifestyle, but holy cow, I'm seeing that like seven out of 10 of these last videos that I've done talking about their different diets, they all tend to do some form of fasting. They also, in his case, like a lot of them do these fasted workouts. He likes to train hard on an empty stomach. The guy looks great. It works for him. And interestingly enough, he finishes his workout. He has a protein shake and then a solid meal. That is precisely what I recommend doing too. You're breaking the fast, so to speak, with your post-workout meal, which really more than anything just needs to be protein to stop the muscle protein breakdown. Okay, when you're working out, there's a balance of muscle protein breakdown and muscle protein synthesis. As you're working out, muscle protein uh, breakdown supersedes synthesis. You reverse that, okay? You don't need to reverse it immediately, but the sooner you reverse it, probably the better. So then you're putting yourself into that synthesis state, a more positive nitrogen balance where your body is building muscle. So at that rate, great, great position to be in. And fun fact, I've talked about this a bunch of times, you can have that protein shake and 30 minutes later have a big protein meal. Take in 120 grams of protein within a two hour period or a one hour period. You will be fine and your body will assimilate it. It's almost better in some ways than eating periodically throughout the day. I personally love gorging on a bunch of protein and then not eating for a few hours and then eating again. So he mentions a big dinner and a dessert. I don't know if he's gonna go into detail on that or not. Let's find out. I mean, you wanna, you wanna, you wanna talk protein shakes? Are we gonna totally bro out and talk protein shakes? Do you even smoothie, bro? This guy is my my favorite protein powder. I'm a vanilla guy. I hear that sort of matches my personality. I like this powder, hum, superfood powder, a little collagen, spinach, peanut butter, blueberries, bananas, and a little bit of love. I don't know. <laughs> I was a little surprised to see him using plant-based protein powder here, but I also understand it because a lot of times it does taste good in a smoothie when you use the plant-based stuff. So no malice there. I absolutely use that from time to time. I'll use like a Sun Warrior active line every now and then. I'll alternate whey protein and, and plant protein in a lot of different cases. Interesting that he's got the spinach in there. I talked about this in Alan Richton's video when I broke apart his diet. Um, spinach, I think we could replace with arugula. We could replace with another green. I think we're starting to see more and more literature supporting that like the oxalates that are in spinach are probably just not worth it. It's not worth the small amount of nutrition you're getting from spinach for the high amount of oxalates that are really hard to clear out of the kidneys. And right now there's a lot of people that'll just say, if you, if you talk smack on any vegetable, you're a zealot. I love vegetables, but we gotta be real. Like, why do we need to take in extra oxalates that we know are problematic and kidney doctors have been talking about for decades as being problematic for the kidneys, the joints, and you name it. Just simply swap it out for our arugula or something like that. Glenn, you will thank me later. I think that as someone that used to use spinach all the time in my smoothies, I get it. It tastes good and it's a way to get greens in there, but there's better ways to get greens. You don't need to have all the oxalates and you can still have greens that have even more potency as far as like non-heme iron and these other things. But I do like that you're using blueberries. Okay, blueberries along with the protein works great. High anthocyanin content, super rich antioxidant that's very good for the brain. So I think you've got a good little combo going there. Okay, but the thing I gotta call you on, man, and this is might be getting too granular. When I talked to Dr. Rhonda Patrick, she mentioned that bananas have a specific compound in them that denatures and makes it so that the polyphenols, it's like a polyphenol oxidase or something, in berries are basically moot. And this is real stuff. Dr. Rhonda Patrick, I know she can be mechanistic at times, meaning she maybe gets in the weeds a little bit with some of the mechanisms and a little less big picture, but she's very smart. And I'm gonna cut to just like a, a one minute section, a one minute section of her talking about what bananas do to berries and why she no longer puts bananas with her berries. No problem with bananas. Bananas are good, they are healthy, they have great stuff in them, they are tremendous, but they don't belong next to a berry because they cancel out a lot of the benefits of the berry. 
pretty wild. So um, yeah, another thing that I've changed my mind on, and this is actually very, very recent, is it's kind of interesting, but it's it's adding bananas to my smoothie. Hmm. And well, I did stop adding bananas a long time ago, but like I've now really like now have to avoid it. And um, I know you're looking at me like, please do no, tell. No, this is interesting, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so smoothies, um, there's actually one of the reasons I like to make smoothies, well, there's a couple of real important ones. So I, m most of my smoothies, I get greens. So a big dose of like greens, you know, a lot of times it's kale ends up being kale. And then a lot of berries like blueberries and blueberries have polyphenols in them. They have flavonoids, they have anthocyanins. All of these things have been shown to improve blood flow. And, and this is in human studies, berries, giving people like even just berries, frozen extract of blueberries. Um, it increases brain-derived neurotrophic factor, actually, mm -hmm. these flavonoids. Brain-derived neurotrophic factor is essential for growing new neurons. Um, that's, you know, called neurogenesis. That's very important for cognition. It's important for staving off brain aging. And um, and so uh, I always feel really good after doing the berries. And so I love doing this my smoothies. And so it used to be I would add a banana, I would kind of like I'd also get some potassium from that but also um, just kind of make it a little creamier and stuff. Well, it turns out bananas have an enzyme in it um, called polyphenol oxidase, <laughs> okay. as the name implies. <laughs> it actually degrades polyphenols. So it's counter, and, and this was a human study that came out recently, adding bananas to the, to the berry smoothies, blueberries and stuff. Metabolites of polyphenols were significantly lower in, in um, plasma from people that had the smoothie that, with the banana added versus not with the banana. I know it was kind of like, oh my goodness. So this is like the one thing I'm trying to get the polyphenols. Like that's the whole goal of why I'm, I'm you know, partly, part, partly the goal of why I'm drinking the smoothie. All right, that was interesting from Dr. Patrick. Let's see what else he talks about here. I love coffee, maybe a little too much, but my favorite bit here, I like a fresh bean. So I'll grind it up in something like this. Throw it in here. Grind it up. Here's the real trick. You want to look like a real barista. Milk steamer. Spin that puppy around. Some layered superfood creamer. You don't have to go anywhere. You'll be just running circles around your house by yourself. That's what I do every morning. Okay, dude, I like this guy. I like what he's going for. So I'm a fan of the layered superfood creamer. I like the MCT compound in it. I like what it's all about. I like you know, some of his brands or some of his products have MCT. I think a lot of them is just like a coconut, uh, coconut powder or something like that. Big fan of Laird. He's a good dude. I've had Gabby, his wife on my channel. So I support that guy for sure. But I love that he's making coffee super fresh like that. I just recorded a video earlier today that basically was implying, didn't just imply. I mean, people that consume three to five cups of coffee have significantly lower risk of cardiovascular disease. And we're not talking small amounts here. We're talking like 12 to 20% less risk in a lot of cases. So there's definitely some evidence there. And there's evidence supporting ground coffee over instant but even decaf coffee had profound effects when it came down to promoting longevity and potentially reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease because of the antioxidant content. So what he's doing it by keeping it in bean form and then grinding it, he's preserving a lot of the antioxidant function of the coffee. So don't be afraid of coffee, okay? Also fun fact, new study that just came out not that long ago suggests that having caffeine in the afternoon before a workout could actually burn significantly more fat. Oxidizing is more fat. Doesn't mean you'll lose more weight, it just means you're oxidizing more fat probably need to be careful talking about that in a video without a lot of context because you don't wanna mess up your sleep. So maybe just check out that video later. How many cups do you have a day? Uh, truly, truly, how many cups a day? Truly. Come on, don't lie. Seven, eight. Sounds about right. Okay, the line of diminishing return was at five, just FYI. So on these studies that we're talking about coffee, after five cups of coffee, the benefit was no longer increasing, it was starting to decrease, but that's right. How do I resist the crafty table on set? Physically, someone has to keep me away. I'm definitely a grazer. I come from a long line of grazers. I tend to stay away from the crafty because it can get pretty ugly. Sometimes you'll shoot a scene and then you look at the next scene and you're like 20 pounds heavier. I've learned my lesson. Okay, the grazing, gonna touch on that for a second. Grazing is the enemy. Take breaks between food. Take breaks between your meals. If you need to abstain, hard line. That's where fasting comes in play. Okay, maybe just don't eat during that time. And once you open the floodgates, it's really hard. If you don't open the floodgates, it's a little easier to control. Don't like focus on the diet because all you do is like think about food. Make something that's like very manageable and easy. Otherwise, like you become like a weird 
obsessed person about food and you never want to be that guy. Everybody hates that guy. That's why I like, I don't ever feel like I'm actually dieting. That is the trick. Eating close to the earth, eating whole foods, you don't feel like you're dieting. I can enjoy fruit. I can enjoy some cereal grains. I can enjoy this stuff. I know how to navigate it. The years of me obsessing are done. I don't want to obsess over that stuff. And my body composition reflects it in a much more positive way. But I also find that's where fasting comes in play. I don't think about food when I'm fasting, right? So by just skipping it, it's harder to control and caloric restrict than it is to just abstain in a lot of ways. I eat what I love, just don't be, just don't be an Just a lesson for life across the board. Don't be in the kitchen or in life. So although there wasn't anything crazy stand out about Glenn Powell's diet, the thing that I liked about it is it had a sustainable approach. Okay, it's something that was realistic. It didn't seem like he ate all that much, but he did train in a fasted state. He did apply some methods of intermittent fasting and it clearly seems to work for him. So as always, if you like these videos, comment down below and maybe if you have ideas for guests that you'd like me to do a sort of critique or an evaluation or an explanation even of their diet, put them down below in the comment section.